Okay, the slides are up. So, just random fact. Uh, you know, uh, in 1936, Russians uh, actually made a computer that ran on water. Anybody heard about the fact? I also didn't know. That's what you do basically when you're jet lagged and wake up at 3 a.m. and wondering <laughs> what you need to do. And was what's... Water or vodka? <laughs> Good question. I'll go and do a fact check. So, moving on. So, as the um, slide, uh, the big font says, I am Atish, work for the Western Digital, and I'm here to talk about the supervisor binary interface that's known as SPI in Desk 5 and what the future uh, looks like for it. Here's a brief agenda of today's talk. I'll briefly introduce what's just a, to give you an uh, overview of what's SPI, what's the current status of it, what are the limitations, and then how we are thinking to extend it so that it can be a clean, better interface. And then we'll talk, I'll, I'll talk about the Open SPI project, which just uh, got, we made it public like a couple of days ago. And uh, we'll have a couple of cool demos for you to see. So to start with, uh, what exactly is SPI? So just to give you an overview, how many guys have actually walked on this five interface or known about SPI? Three, four. Okay, it's good enough audience. So just to give you an over, overview, so SPI is a supervisor, supervisor binary interface that gives a clean separation between your supervisor mode and machine mode. So anything that machine mode is not exposed to the S mode, that's basically implemented via an SPI, which is a similar interface you can see between ABI and SPI. And that interface, uh, by that interface, supervisor mode talks to your supervisor execution environment, which is basically on bare metals, it's a M mode. So what's the, uh, if you have any of you closely followed what's being discussed in the mailing list recently, a couple of months ago, there's a huge difference of opinion saying what exactly the SPS future look like. Should it have all or sh it should not be exist at all? This all kinds of spectrum. If I, I, I'm pretty sure if I do a vote here, it's probably split by half and half. So to me, it's not surprising because it's kind of a double-edged sword where uh, you start putting a lot of stuff in SBI, it becomes a mini OS, and then it becomes a big firmware, which becomes big and messy. But it, as of now, where it is, so if we can make it a clean uh, interface, and if we can go forward and keep whatever necessary required in it, it can help Risk Five achieve what it needs. And something like any architecture limitation that's now present, but maybe in two years down the line that architecture limitation will not be there. We can add it in the SPI and then in future we can adopt the op operating supervisor OS to implement that instead of SPI. So that's where having a good specification and implementation makes sense for SPI. So currently it's implemented by uh, BBL and uh, this uh, how it works is basically it's a supervisor uh, trap and emulate. So you basically trap into M mode using an e-call instruction. You pass your uh, SPA call number in A7 registers, pass your, ar pass your arguments in A0 to A2 arg uh, registers. And then in case of uh, you want to return something, you return using a clobber register A0. It's, uh, the existing implementation is documented in uh, the, one of the GitHub repository that's mentioned here. Now, here is the current interface that exists. So we have a timer uh, call and a Y timer because currently Risk Five doesn't have a uh, timer register that can be accessed through S mode, which can be used to program uh, the timer. So when you get the next, when do I get the next periodic event? That's where it comes into picture. Then we have console and IPI. So whenever we send an interprocessor interrupts to other CPU, uh, we need to go trap into the M mode and then send it because the client access, everything is M mode only. Similarly, TLB flushing, we have like all the memory model interfaces for TLB flushing, we need to call an SPI and uh, a shutdown API. So what's the problem with it? Why it is limited or why do we need to change it? First, uh, it's fixed. So there are eight APIs, those are fixed. There is no present way to extend it. And 
uh, if even if we add it, uh, add new functionality, we are probably going to break the backward compatibility. That's where uh, we need to have a specification that allows modifying it, adding it, or removing functions from it without breaking backward compatibility. What kind of features we need to add? Something like power management, or let's say CPU hot or CPU hot plug, which is basically necessary and required for any kind of systems that you build today. So coming back to the specification that we talked about, now we are, I think Alex is in the room, so there is a lot of discussion about how we define the scope, like where do we stop it, uh, defining uh, the uh, SPI scope. So that is my view, saying it shouldn't be, as I said, it shouldn't be treated as a kitchen sink. You cannot dump any feature you want, or vendors cannot should not dump any features they want. Whatever functionality they suggest, if it is absolutely necessary, then only it should be implemented SBI without breaking the backward compatibility. So backward compatibility is absolutely necessary. We do not want to go ahead and have something that's not going to let's work in the previous version. And uh, we all agree that we see that there is a future where RISC-V can be the ubiquitous ISA among all the devices. So no mandated usage should be there of, let's say, D this is DT-specific implementation or ACPI-specific implementation. It's open to adopt anything, and we probably want to keep it in that way. And any functionality that currently SPI has, probably uh, we should have a, uh, uh, we should allow it to be replaced by your S-mode software and feature. So something like a timer. So there were discussions about having a S-mode timer registers that will allow to remove that S-mode, uh, sorry, a mode SBI call. And these are the only, uh, some of the few points that define the scope. There are a lot of other discussions happening, so anything else, as this is a evolving discussion, we can keep on adding as long as it makes sense, and uh, we define the SBI within that scope. Now, uh, how the specification working will progress. So as of now, it's been decided that uh, the specification will be part of the RISC-V Unix class, pro, class uh, platform specification. Uh, it need to be approved by the working group, and it need to be, uh, you need to have an implementation before the freeze. Now, why the working group? Again, there is some discussion about why we are going to a closing uh, discussion, why it's not happening in the mailing list. Actually, it is an open discussion. It's not, uh, having forming and work, working group doesn't mean that it's a closed discussion. In fact, the proof that I'm talking about it without having the first meeting of the working group is a proof that it's being discussed in the public forum with everybody, and then we are taking inputs from everybody. But uh, the objective of the working group to make progress on the specification in continuously and uh, finalize it within finite amount of time. We cannot have years and years to just talking about it, but not actually finalizing spec and not implementing it. And also, a working group makes sure that there is one reference implementation available for every SBI specification that we make or every, specific, every SBI modification that we make. So that's decided that to keep the discussion focused, we'll have a minimum base mandatory spec, which will define the, just the layout, saying how the versioning should be management and how the functionality should be managed. That's it. That will be mandatory for every future SPA versions. Then there will be any other something like power management, either uh, CPU or system. All those will be an extension to it. So that will be uh, that can be worked as a again uh, by different people in the same working group, and then that those can run in parallel, while the based on the layouts defined by the base specifications. So uh, let's take a look what all is being proposed as a base specification. So calling convention, whatever the calling, calling convention e exists today, it also uh, kind of works. The only thing uh, I think that's suggested by Ron a uh, couple of months ago, so we can have a return value with a structure, which, is, which gives you a flexibility to uh, distinguish the difference between your the, whatever the SPA function returns and what the uh, SPA library wants to return. So those are two different things, and this is the way to distinguish it. And that's where uh, RISC-V ISA came in as a help, because it defines that, ABI defines that we can have 
two registers as a return value. Other than that, uh, the existing calling convention, which is documented in the GitHub, uh, stands uh, correct for the even updated proposal. So the new thing that we are add, going to add is a versioning scheme, which is basically a major and minor, which is standard versioning scheme that everybody follows. Uh, 16 bits, minor 16, on the last 16 bits, upper 16 bits are uh, basically defined the ma major version. Your uh, the existing current legacy version will be 0 0.1, so that's called legacy. We hope that we'll get rid of it one day. The base version that we're talking about here, which will be mandatory, will start with the 0 0.2, and going forward, depending on what kind of feature we're adding, we'll keep on adding the version numbers. Now, there's a function ID that we need to define. So it's again an unsigned 32-bit uh, integer. So the function ID is basically a combination of function set and a function type. Function set is similar kind of functionality that can be grouped is a function set. And the function type is basically individual functions feature of a feature that's being added. So something like, uh, let's say, legacy. Legacy is a function set. All this base specification we are discussing, it's a function set which is basically statically defined uh, IDs that are assigned. Then uh, we have, let's say, CPU power management or system power management. All those, are, those IDs are predefined assigned. And we also have some, some, something like a reserved reason, which, is, which allows anybody to, let's say, somebody is experimenting with uh, a SBI call, and we are not sure whether that fits into any of the function ID or uh, a function set or you need to have your own function set. So that's where reserved comes into picture. You can have, pick any number from the reserved, and in future, if you want to keep it that way, you can keep, or you can move it to any of the function set. The last, which is, I guess, most controversial thing, is the vendor extension. So whether we need, I hope we don't have to, but since ISA allows you to have vendor-specific ISAs, there may be a future where we don't know there may be a future where vendor might absolutely need it. If we don't provide it now and they need it in future, we might be breaking the compatibility. So let's see if it makes sense to keep it. Again, it's just a proposal. It's still being discussed, so it's not like finalized and set in stone. So there's a scope to scope in scope for revision for everything. Now this is the base version functions. <coughs> These are the only functions that will be mandatory to implement and uh, basically uh, will be part of the SPA version. So something like, it's a no-brainer, we need to have a version, so SBI get version, which returns the specification version. Then there is SBI implementation version, which is basically uh, the imp provided by the software that's implementing the SBI. So something like, let's say, OpenSBI provides this one, and OpenSBI gets an ID, same, something like, let's say, one, one, two. And then there is another software, let's say Core Boot implements SPI. So Core Boot gets like one, three. So that's help, that helps to identify the difference. So to know that supervisor mode, that which software actually implementing the SPI. Similarly, we have a function set and function type. It's just a probing of whether a particular function set exists, and within that function set, whether a particular function type exists. Then we have get vendor ID and machine implementation ID, which basically returns you the value that's uh, stored in M vendor ID register and MIMP uh, CSR. And this vendor ID and MIMP helps you to identify which particular vendor specific functions if they uh, in the future if they have or if we have a vendor specific APIs or uh, SPI uh, that helps to identify which vendor belongs to which function belongs to which vendor and all. Lastly, we have an implementation ID, which basically, oh, sorry, I switched the earlier one. So earlier I was talking about the implementation ID, which is basically a specific ID for SPI implementation. And the second one was SPI implementation version, which is, uh, so something like Open SPI or BBL or Core Boot, they get an implemented implementation ID, which is fixed, let's say 1.1.1.2 and 1.3. And then there is open implementation version where uh, open SPI will be have 0 0.1, 0 0.2, or 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.3. Similarly, Core Boot might have a different version. So that's where they communicate between what features, what specification they implement, what feature they support, and what uh, software they are talking about. So this is all about the specification 
how SPS specification will be, what will be all, what will all be implemented in the specification. Uh, but what about the implementation? We need a solid standard implementation that provides the SBI that not only provides the implementation after the uh, spec is frozen, it should also, we should also provide it while the spec is, the discussion is going on so that we know whether the, whatever we are proposing or somebody else is proposing or it's what's being discussed makes sense. So currently we have two options, BBL and Core Boot provides the separate SPA implementation. In future, there may be more fragmentation, there will be more different SPA implementation because everybody goes and tries to implement their own because everybody's core structure, everybody's uh, open source model is different. And so that becomes a pain to difficult to track and uh, maintain those SPA changes. Everybody, now we don't know which version, which, uh, who implements which version and then how they are backward compatible. Then with the BBL has been really useful and uh, helpful until now in bringing up all the risk 5 systems but this is a fundamental problem in BBL is that it doesn't uh, it has a tightly coupled platform code and SBI code so if you want to swap out or modify SBI code without changing in the platform code that becomes messy or if you want to add new platform support that becomes difficult so keeping in all this uh, mind uh, that's where uh, the open SBA comes into picture that's why open SBA is being developed so let's take a look what exactly Open SBI is. So it's an open source SBI implementation project. So all we need is a standard implementation that everybody can use, which adheres to all the specs that we propose. It's driven by a community, uh, the open source community, and it has the most permissive license. So it's you are open to take it, implement it, modify it, whatever you want, and we would like to contribute back so that it grows and becomes a, the, the standard project. It's fine to have another uh, SPA implementation as well. It, it's not mandated. It's not uh, saying, nobody saying that this is the only SPA implementation that should exist in future. But this is a reference implementation. At least we'll make sure that every specification is implemented. If there are a couple of other, that's still good. But at least I hope that this will prevent 10 other to fork it. Couple of other is OK. So how, uh, what does it actually do? So it builds a static library that uh, any of the, uh, that's just a SPA implementation and any of the mode bootloader can link. It also provides you on reference implementation for your platform code and your firmware code. And it also uh, uses PMP to protect your firmware. So uh, it's well documented. Go and take a look at GitHub repository. And it's all standard GitHub process is followed. So if you have an issue, raise it. Uh, if you have a doubt, just ask the question in the GitHub. Uh, there are a couple of pull requests and issues already pending in the GitHub. So I said a lot of things about this is what OpenSBA does. So let's see how it does, what exactly it builds, and what I said is uh, how the objective is achieved using OpenSBI. So first, it builds on libsbi.a, which is just an SBI implement. It's a static library and it just implements the SBI. That's it. Doesn't have any other feature. So uh, any uh, any M mode bootloader basically can link this SBI implementation for their SBI uh, feature, and they don't have. So this prevents uh, forking of SBI implementation, varying degree of SBI, uh, for uh, using different SBI implementation and everybody coming up with their own. So. And as I said, we make sure that we'll make sure that every future proposed SPA specification or extension will be implemented in libspa.a. And it also builds on libplatspa.a. So libplatspa.a is like a container that has the libspa.a. It uses the libspa.a to use the static to use the get the SPA feature. So again, uh, what? the difference between libspa.a and platspa.a, as the name suggests, it also has the platform support. So all the platform drivers, whatever the minimal platform driver required, that's what the platspa.a uses. So any of the vendors or a SOC platform support require, they, let's say they already have, uh, they already uh, IP blocks that are already implemented in OpenSPA. They'll just take this one and build their own firmware. 
So what all platform we have supported? We already have support for QMU Vault, QMU Sci-Fi View, uh, obviously Sci-Fi Unlist. So we have complete support for Unlist, and we also have CanWrite support, which is like $20 amazing this skyboard, which can run free atos, do face recognition and whatnot. So, so almost I can say that any SOC that's available, that's supported by OpenSPI currently. If not, uh, if anybody has an SOC on that we are not aware of, please talk to us. We'll try to make sure that it's also supported using OpenSPI. So the last uh, piece that OpenSPI builds is a firmware binary. So all this firmware binary, it's just a reference implementation to showcase how PlatSPI or LibSPI is used. But it also complete a platform specific uh, bootable binary. So you can just take it and use it for your own project. You just, if it is a different platform, you just add your platform support and then you, well, you get your platform firmware binary completely and you just go ahead and uh, use it. Uh, if you existing, if you're trying to use the existing platform, that platform, let's say unleashed platform you need, just build it and then uh, you will get the binary. You will we'll have, uh, obviously uh, binary releases as well, which will directly work on the Unleashed platform or any other future platforms uh, that come up and we have access to. So there's two ways of uh, building the firmware. One is uh, basically with a payload, which is a standard mechanism of giving you, uh, you give the uh, next, so next is bootloader or next is uh, image as a payload to OpenSPI. OpenSPI combines it and uh, boots it and make sure that uh, it from OpenSPI it boots the next image. There is a feature that we can add a device tree as a separate file. So any of the device tree modification that you want, you can uh, go ahead and uh, do with it. So the next uh, type of the firmware that uses is uh, it builds is using a jump address. So that let's say the previous stage to the OpenSPI knows how to load the next stage to the OpenSPI. So in that case, you don't really don't care about the payload. The payload can come from anywhere. So you just provide the jump address, and then it makes sure that it will jump to the next address, which is being loaded by the previous stage. Now, as I said, vendors can choose uh, either way to, depending on their flexibility, either way to build their firmware or just use as it is. So all this talk is required to standardize the boot flow. So that's the big mess I think Kasten also mentioned, saying we need to standardize the boot flow. We need to follow what every other, uh, uh, let's say, ARC64 or x86 or a, every other uh, boot flow that's uh, being used, we need to follow that model. And we, that's where all the CI, everything comes into picture because they don't, nobody wants to change only for risk five. So we need to support whatever the upstream uh, all the bootloader support. So this is the current boot flow. So we have uh, JSPL, then FSPL, which is like M mode, uh, ROM based uh, binaries, and then it loads BBL. BBL basically combines the Linux image into it, embedded embeds into it, and then DT, uh, there is no way to separate the DT from the kernel image. There is no way to uh, do the network booting. That's where OpenSPI has been implemented to address all these issues. So how does uh, the OpenSPI feature as the standard boot flow is the same uh, model, just the OpenSPI replaces the BBL, but here you have the ability to create separate data file, uh, DT files, and uh, you can boot complete Linux, uh, full SMP support is there, and you can boot, uh, give, basically you give a Linux payload uh, to a OpenSPI, and then it just uh, boots Linux. But the upstream model that I was talking about is this one, which I'm really excited about saying, uh, it's the same thing, if JSP and FSPL, then we have OpenSPI, which is M mode, which boots into your U-boot S mode, and then you just provide the Linux image into the U-boot as every other uh, implementation or every other architecture does it. So you have a kernel image, you just load it via network, that's where it's also supported. So this is the standard flow. So U-boot becomes the last stage bootloader, not a BBL or not OpenSPI. And you have you load the image uh, via TFTP boot. And as of now, uh, yeah, it can only boot one core out of the, it boot, builds SMP and boot SMP, but you can we can bring up only one core in uh, Unleashed because there is no support in U-boot SMP support. So 
as long as we as soon as we have a uh, hard power management, we can bring up all the CPUs. It's just put in the WFI loop in OpenSPI. So this is just a quick um, instruction, quick instruction overview. The detailed instructions, everything is available in uh, docs and for each platform. So this is just a quick, quick way to show you that how you do, how do you build and uh, generate the binaries. So this is basically two arguments. Uh, uh, one is platform. So you say whether it's a QMU or sci-fi platform. And the next one, whether you want to give a uh, payload path or you want to give a jump address. So this is how you provide the Linux image as a direct payload. So you just assign saying uh, make platform, QMU vert, and then this is my Linux image uh, path. And then this is a standard way to run QMU REST pipe. And you give the rootfs file as the QMU drive file. If you are using using uh, U-boot to load it, just say the same thing, make platform, QMU vert, then you give a payload path as a uboot.bin, your bi uboot binary, and then uh, for running it, you just run uh, QMU with, uh, here, uh, notice that there is no rootfs required because we are using uboot. So it will boot into uboot, and then you follow standard uboot model to load your kernel image. Similar process in the hi five unleashed as well, where you just give your platform as the sci fi FU540, and your payload path as a kernel image, and for you boot, same thing. And this is a screenshot open SPI booting Linux directly. Uh, I don't think it's visible, but anyways, I have a demo, so don't worry. This is another screenshot which was basically open SPI booting Linux using U boot. So I have a couple of demos that I wanted to show. Let me see if demo gods are happy with me and if it works. Otherwise, I just a backup video I'll show you. You know how do I slide the windows? Yeah. Oh, okay. Come on. Okay, I have it. Okay. So here is my TFTP boot server, and then. Here is the other window, and okay. So here I am as the boot prompt. Okay, so let me reboot and just show you. This is the e-boot uh, prompt. So in a minute you will see Open SBI booting e-boot, and I have a preloaded image binary that basically uh, has uh, e-boot as the payload. And it uh, boots using this is the unleashed board. That's a sci-fi unleashed board we have. And you see open SPI and booting here U boot. And uh, you see open SPI. Just hold on. Okay. So now you see open SPI has been uh, booting uh, unleashed uh, unleashed board using U boot. And the rest of the things we just need to use a TFTP boot to load the image. Let's see if I can do that. Yes, so currently that's not yet done because there is no SPA driver in U-Boot. As soon as somebody puts the SPA driver in U-Boot, that will be possible. Okay, here I am. I guess I need to, okay, so all the network is set up. Oh, it's too below. Now, if you can see that screen, can you see? I don't know. I'm just typing TFTP boot image. Hopefully, it will work. We'll see. Oh, I did not set the server IP. 
I did the circle right thing on the side. Hmm. Was there a random character? I'll just type it. It's working, so it boots. So, demogods are not that angry with me. So, it load the address with the 60. So, we just copy that and put here. And let's see if it boots kernel. So, ideally, it should boot Fedora 29. Oh, it boots now. So, this is basically the demo that I wanted to show. So, it, you have OpenSPI, you boot and you load your Linux image and here is your Fedora without changing anything, uh, without recompiling the Linux every time and you just load your image from wherever you want. So, it will take a couple of minutes to get into the prompt. Just wanted to show you it, I am not faking this one. So, any questions in the meantime? I can take a couple of questions until this boot, so it takes a bit time. Do you have to assign vendor IDs? Not yet. So, so this is all standard, whatever the existing SPI. So we have not changed anything to the SPI. Once the spec is frozen, we'll have all those uh, implementations. And vendor ID, we don't have to assign. We just pick, uh, get from the M vendor ID CSR, which is already given by the specific, uh, I think, privilege spec. So the basically privilege spec, or the the manufacturer will not have JTX spec ID. Is that possible? I thought it's mandatory to have the vendor ID. No. So the question is the open source versions. So there's a like the high bit in vendor ID is either open source or not open source, and the open source ones right now are just listed in the stack. So you just get your own ID. Any other question? It's still booting. <laughs> How is the, in the supervisor binary interface, for those of us that are new but familiar with Dubu, how is this applied to the Unleashed board? Because I'm confused where it comes into play. I mean, we have a GPL, you know, Dubu. Mm -hmm. Where is the S? What's so, the part that's here? So, supervisor we implemented is, super, SBI is implemented by the open SBI. So U-boot doesn't have to deal with that. So U-boot acts as a bootloader. So it's pro think it like it provides a runtime services. So runtime, you need to send an IPI. Runtime, you need to perform the count, uh, program the counter. So U-boot doesn't have to deal with any SPI implementation. It's Linux, uh, the supervisor OS, that actually needs to, this, uh, needs to make those SBI calls. As of now, U-boot don't need that. So uh, what all we need to U-boot is the uh, fix the network driver, support the UART driver so that we get the U-boot prompt, and then uh, just add the unleashed board support in U-boot. The patches are being upstream, so it should be available in mainline. Maybe some of the confusion on the mailing list is just from an architectural point of view that everyone is nervous about having any BSD binaries in this layer. I mean, we have the ideal of the RISC-V being this open architecture on like ARM, and we have basically that, and then GPL, U-boot, and then the Linux kernel. It's like putting the BSD binaries in there is a concern, I think, to so, a lot of us, because we've been screwed over by that before. It seems dangerous. I would prefer that Western Digital supported a GPL implementation for this, 
just to close out binary only proprietary ports here is I think the feedback you're going to hear. You're okay, certainly so going to hear it from me. Okay, yeah, <laughs> sure. No, sure. So, so I thought... Uh, Yeah, we could make it really hard not to. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we have a lot of leverage here. No, but that's how, how security does come into play because you have a like a standard, a, a reference version that was tested everybody that to work on it in GPL, and because the vendors don't want to, they won't run their own secret software, and they cannot uh, use the GPL version. They write everything from scratch. So yeah. boom, you can start it from the lower. And, and that will happen, right? If they don't, if they can't use their security, they will just write it themselves. Well, they can just go use ARM. They don't need to use RISC-V. <laughs> <laughs> so use this architecture. They can go make their own and do a tool chain and port TLIPC and whatever. Yeah, they want to make them Yeah, we do. <laughs> I'd like to point out an, an error that I see just about everyone making. People are, to people talk about because the current boot process, because of how simple it is, start because you're, it's, it starts out in M mode and then it, and then it, and then does almost nothing before running a, a kernel in S mode. People think of the privilege level as decreasing during a boot, but no, the boot process and the privilege level are are, per, are perpendicular. If you have like a, ne a net boot system which requires a rich environment to build a full network stack in order to load the kernel. That's going to, to. That means that your your privilege stack and your boot order are at, are simultaneously ex existing. You can have a, a machine mode, a supervisor mode, and a user mode while you're lo while you're fetching net boot resources. You can have a machine mode, a supervisor mode, a user mode. After the boot process is completed, we can and should have a chain loading mechanism that replaces all three privilege modes. We also need more restricted chain loading mechanisms because a virtual machine is not going to have an M mode. But yeah. the, 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 the solution the solution to we, we want we want to be, to be able to give hardware manufacturers the option the ability to opt out of an unmodifiable M mode is not to sabotage the a, the SBI. It's it's to have a Defined a defined procedure for handing over the keys. Okay. <clears throat> Giving hardware manufacturers options from a free software point of view, I think. But that they we, we control no. much more of the power than we used to, and capitulating to the requests on designs of chips that they can modify this in ways that is uninteresting. I think to us. I, I don't know why we would bother even trying to help. But okay. otherwise, it will uh, how the risk five mass adoption will happen. So the I way think because we're, because it's going to be better than anything else. We we hold all the power here. Here also, let's they, say they can go license arm all day long and do every stupid proprietary Microsoft garbage that they do there. <laughs> I think we should not help them at all. Like right now, we have enormous power as software engineers. It's almost a coup against the hardware manufacturers. We're going to define. How this works. But what if they, let's say it's a GPL, they take it and make it their proprietary, as I say, as he said, I as I said. Well, you're, you're also making the, the implicit the assumption that the GPL is still enforceable in 2019. It is. Yeah, okay, but we have good lawyers. I, 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 don't, I didn't understand the argument that if it's GPL, they're going to do what? They're going to change no, it? They're going to write it themselves, right? I mean, is anyone They're going to write it themselves. Fine, they can you do know, that. The thing is, if, if you don't expect, if you think vendors aren't going to fork this stuff, you're, you're not living in the world I live in, where they fork it for they every damn board they build. Yeah. So one option is you could dual license it for people who want to dual license. That solved the problem in a lot of areas. Yeah. One, one of the, going on from the licensing, because I don't know, I just have one quick question. There's a bunch of us talking. We've never understood, following this discussion, why you didn't put the bindings in the FTP, because you've defined this space with 11 bits of vendor and 16 bits, and then your idea is you're going to probe that space 
which if I did my math right is 2 to the 27 times I'm going to call and say, but do you do this? I, I don't understand why you wouldn't just put the bindings in. In fact, in some sense, by not putting the bindings in the FDT, this ends up even looking worse than ACPI, and there's nothing worse than ACPI. <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't, just don't understand why you're not so enumerating it in tables instead of asking me to call a function yeah, over and over. I again. know we had that discussion, but then yeah. there are other side of the people which basically wants ACPI or something, somebody mentioned thing, we want Windows to run on risk 5 so. I don't, I don't get so, so we don't want to cut themselves out, cut them out, like. I, I don't get that sure. argument at all. Why, so if you put the bindings in the FTT, who is that cutting out? And so whoever doesn't use uh, device tree, so. Okay. But, no, so put so it in both places, I just don't get the problem here, right? I can't understand the idea that probing by doing repeated calls is better and, and following on that. Have you, have you outlined what the costs of a call in the SBI are? Because you're asking people to call in the SBI to but do a fence, which is... That I, no, no that's... the SBI to do a remote fence. Okay. That, yeah. Interrupting another heart to, to do it to do a fence Okay, you're right. Heart. But so, still, you know, what is, like we had this discussion. I was at a low risk the last two days. And when you drop into the SBI, you're going to probably, in most cases, have to blow all the pipelines out. So... What are you looking at in terms of a cost to SBI? No, Have you listed that or enumerated it? or? Not yet, but that's what basically, that's why we had that thing. I think you mentioned thing. We should be able to replace any of the S mode, uh, by S mode. So let's say tomorrow there is yeah. the timer one, uh, there is a uh, architecture register, we go and replace it. Okay. So let's say there is a better way to do the IPI or TLB flushing, we go and replace it. That's why those are, as of now, is not mandatory. Those fall under okay. legacy. But uh, to answer your question regarding the initial part, initial probing, yeah. uh, the assumption is here is it's, uh, it will all happen in uh, early boot. So you just uh, query in the beginning and uh, whatever feature you require and just uh, store it in a bit mask or some feature. Uh, I yeah. still think it will be... I mean, there's going to be, there, there's at least one company I know that's not going to have in the, in the processor. But the, the, the counterpoint of what yeah. I just said is that, is that runtime services should, 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 be, should require the smallest possible amount of, of privilege. And the stuff, stuff like re remote fences can and should be done entirely in S mode. Yeah. So, but yeah. That, that requires so more interfaces which are separate from the SBI. And, and another thing I don't see going on at all in any of this is any kind of verified boot. Any thoughts yeah. around verified boot, and it just seems like there's no consideration of any of those issues in here at all. So that, that that's what I'm saying. So all those things will at least fall into place. So that's why we wanted to focus on the first get the best SBI, so that at least we get it done, and then any let's say verified boot power management, we keep on adding it. Yeah. But if we keep like from the beginning of the discussion, we keep diverging to verified boot and yeah. uh, let's say power management, things doesn't so, get done. And I'm sorry, the final final thing I thought about is in core boot. Our use of this would be to compile it in, which we would not use it as a .a, because you got. To, I've looked at your code, and you've got a lot of things that will clash with names in Corbu, like, for example, printf. Mm -hmm. And and so, um, it just a take home way for you. If you need it, and we can work with you on this. If you need, if you could think of ways that something like Corbu would say, "Gosh, they've done a nice job on a lot of this actual implementation," mm -hmm. but they want to compile it in. Right? We're not going to use it as a .a. So, um, I think that's fine. That should be fine. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. yeah. That, that, there, I, there are ways you could have structured things that make it hard. It doesn't look like it'll be hard for us to do it. So yes. It's just, I'm, I just wanted to get it out there. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that was the initial motivation to have most permissive license that any anybody can use it. But um, I understand the argument. But eventually, you think like if we restrict it, then people will just write their own. Then. We will not able to enforce anything with that, but at least if keep using, op let's say vendors keep using Open SBI, then at least we have a way to enforce everything. What we accept, what we accept in kernel, what we accept in Open SBI yeah, is up yeah, to the group. Some, so I mean, there's we're talking about minor amounts of code, yeah. and your argument from a vendor point of view is that there's some intellectual property that some investment banker cares about in a, in a trivial bootloader at the beginning of code where it's all free on every single direction, there's no corporate argument here. Like, whoever, I mean, we'll force that down their throat. 
Okay, yeah, we can talk about it, and as I said, like, it says risk five, so we have complete booting flow. <laughs>